All right, welcome to lecture six, Ajax. So this stuff is pretty fun. It's pretty trendy. Uh, give me an example of a website that uses technology or this technique known as Ajax. Netflix. What's that? Netflix. Netflix. OK, give me another. CS75.net, kayak.com, Google Maps, uh, uh, Gmail, pretty much anything, frankly, Google does these days, except its search engine uh, uses Ajax. So what is Ajax exactly? <laughs> it's not subtle when you do it right in front of the camera like that. Oh, it's OK. <laughs> so in, uh, in a sentence or so, what is Ajax? Because presumably you signed up for this course in part because of familiarity, perhaps, with this technique. So, so why are you here? And it's fine if you signed, out, signed up without familiarity, and that's why you're here. What's it all about? It's the ability to change part of the web page without having to change the whole web page. Yeah, so it's this ability to change part of a web page without having to refresh the entirety of the web page. So contrast this with, for instance, um, MapQuest, which is a site that most of us probably used for some period of time, Yahoo Maps as well. But if you wanted to pan to the left or pan to the right, you would click the arrow. And then at least part of the page might reload, or the whole thing might reload back in the day. Then enter a couple years ago, Google Maps. You just click, drag, and you automatically see new content being integrated into the page. So in short, Ajax is largely about creating more fluid, a more seamless, so to speak, user interface. But there's some really interesting stuff that goes on underneath the hood to make happen and as we'll see tonight there are some headaches that we incur as well we want your Ajax site to work on all those browsers so let's take a look at this example uh, fragment of XHTML it's pretty simple we have the doc type we have the HTML element a head a body and inside the body we have a link and we have a header using the h1 tag so this is a flashback to what we did in I think lecture 0 or lecture 1 uh, this year when we began talking about XML and I promised it would recur because what we're going to talk about all the more tonight is how this kind of page, even this simple page, is modeled inside of memory, inside of a browser, inside of RAM, so to speak. So a typical workflow for a browser is a user sits down at it, types in a URL, hits enter. We know that the HTTP request goes across the wire to a web server. The response comes back, generally in the form of some HTML or XHTML. What the browser then uh, proceeds to do uh, in some form or other is to build in memory a representation of that document, a uh, representation known as a DOM, a document object model, which in short is the tree representation of what's already a clearly hierarchical structure. And it's a little messier for just HTML pages because it's less clear to the parser where things might begin and where things might end. But certainly for well-formed XHTML, it's pretty easy to infer or to map visually this document onto, say, this document. We have the root element, of course, known as the HTML element. We then have two children, head and body. The body, in turn, has two children, the order of which does matter. So they're read typically left to right as uh, top to bottom. They might be in the web page itself. The A tag followed by the H1 tag. And now each of these tags, as we'll begin to appreciate even more tonight, actually have children themselves. And if you spend more time in, say, some other class or just outside of this class on XML and all things related, this element here, the H1 tag and the close H1 tag, those represent an element, an, X, uh, an XML or XHTML element. But how many children does this H1 element have? So in a normalized DOM, it has just one child. And by that, I mean it has a text node beneath it. And a text node is just a generic type of node that doesn't have a name per se, but just has a value, in this case, a string value. And I say a normalized DOM just to be anal, because in theory, you could actually hang off of the H1 element, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine child nodes, and then the concatenation of which is equivalent to this. But for the most part, you think of text nodes as just being all together and not something crazy like that. So it's a normalized DOM. Now there's this issue of attributes. So this is really just a visual thing. But typically, when folks sketch out a DOM or think of a DOM, you'll think of uh, the attributes as being sort of a linked list laterally off of that node, because it doesn't really make sense to think of attributes as being a descendant of a node. So you just kind of string them along to the side. But their order is irrelevant. So just to be clear, in DOM, there's different types of nodes. So a DOM is a tree. In this tree are different types of nodes. The most common, perhaps, type of node is an element node. 
And all of these things represented collectively with a start tag and an end tag, one of which I have accidentally omitted. So if you want to take a, a pencil to that and add in the close body tag, each of those represents an element. There are text nodes, which can be inside of uh, element nodes. There are attribute nodes, as depicted here with this particular rectangle. And then as an aside, there's things like uh, comment nodes. There's things like processing instruction nodes, which are more from the XML world than the web page world, and a couple of other different types of nodes. And this will be important only insofar as tonight we start looking at JavaScript, which has support for DOM and methods that allow you to traverse and change this DOM. So specifically, AJAX is all about, as you said, inserting new content dynamically into a web page. Well, what that means in sort of HTML form is if you're about to go grab some new content from the web to in insert it into your web page, it's like sort of squeak moving this down and inserting some new content, perhaps, in response to a user's click or some such thing. And in the DOM, it might be equivalent to hanging another child off of the body if you're trying to insert more content into the tree. And so the process of inserting content into a web page for us tonight is going to boil down to either inserting raw HTML or XHTML into the page or inserting new nodes in the document. So in the one case, the browser deals with how to make that happen. In the other case, we exercise more precise control over how to create this. And we'll, we'll tease this apart with a bunch of examples. So where can you learn more about DOM and such? Not that you would want to for uh, just for kick's sake, but because this will be useful as you begin to use JavaScript to manipulate the DOM to update content via AJAX, I found these to be three pretty good references. So one, our friends over at the W3 schools, another at JavaScript Kit, and then this last one. And I offer these up as just uh, references that you can use for functions or methods related to this stuff tonight. All right. So what is it that makes uh, AJAX possible? So believe it or not, it was actually Microsoft that first made this possible in a number of incarnations of IE a while back. And it was the precursor to what is now generally supported by most major browsers, namely an object called the XML HTTP request object. So this object that you have access to in, most, in any major browser today via JavaScript. And it's this object and the methods and properties inside of it that allow a web page that contains some JavaScript and instantiates one of these objects. It's that object that allows it to make other HTTP requests without changing the whole page. So the typical workflow is a user still brings up a page via URL as normal, but then inside of that page is some JavaScript that creates one of these things, and then some other JavaScript calls methods inside of this object that goes and fetches more data, typically on demand or on some schedule, like our courses website for office hours and such. So canonical references for this stuff I would propose to be this. You have Microsoft's view of the world, which in fact differs slightly from Mozilla's view of the world, and then you have the W3's version of the world which is thankfully an attempt to standardize what this thing looks like. And by that I mean what the, fun the methods look like, what the properties are called, and such. So two last just pieces of push-based information, and then we'll dive into some examples. So you've got one of these objects that you're going to create in uh, some lines of JavaScript by just calling the new function, effective, uh, the new keyword effectively. What can you do once you have one of these objects in memory? Well, you can use it to open a connection via get or post, for instance, that being method. You can pass it a specific URL. So where do you want to go get more content from? Then there's this notion of asynchronicity. So what's neat about AJAX is that the calls can be asynchronous. And what does that generally mean in the context of web requests? Yeah, exactly. So what's neat about uh, Google Maps, for instance, is that even if your connection's slow, or maybe Google's slow, and you click and drag for new content, the whole page isn't going to lock up for the second or two that it takes to grab the new content. Rather, Google will just show you a placeholder, like a little gray image that says, says something like, please waiting, or the equivalent. So you can continue interacting with the page, even though it's a brief period of time, but in the background are things continuing to happen. And that's an example of asynchronicity because the browser is not waiting for Google's response to come back before returning control to you. And that's a powerful thing in terms of creating the illusion of a much more interactive interface. By contrast, all of us have used badly designed client-side software that you, for instance, do um, 
I mean, even the print feature, for instance, even though printing is spooled and multi-threaded these days, you hit uh, Alt-P and hit Enter. Sometimes you kind of have to wait until all the pages are sent to the printer. That's an example of a synchronous uh, function call or some such thing, where you have to wait in line for that to finish before you can get back to doing your work. So this is just a Boolean flag being passed to any of these different versions of this send, uh, this open method, which just says if it's true, that means just make this, uh, send this call on its way, but then return immediately to the user. And I'll get back to the user, we'll see, when I'm ready, when the content has come back from Google or the like. And then you can pass in a username or password if that URL requires authentication of some sort. So you've opened a connection now. What do you now want to do? Well, presumably you want to send some data. You might want to send some uh, HTTP um, parameters and values, the things like foo equals bar, ampersand, baz equals quux, and so forth. So that kind of data, which we'll be able to send by using some familiar form elements. Uh, we might want to send some request headers for caching reasons and those kinds of things. Um, we might want to get back the response headers for fairly arcane purposes sometimes, or we might want to abort. But the real magic happens, frankly, with just two methods. Open a connection, send some data, and then you're going to wait for a response to come back. And we'll show in a moment how you get that response back. Um, let's do this. Before I dive in with yet more nitty gritty, let's take a look at an example. So here we have in your printouts tonight an example called ajax1.html. And this is available online as well in our lecture six source. And what this thing looks like is the following. It's a terribly simple web page because I'm fo focusing as a typical in lecture on um, a functionality as opposed to aesthetics. And all I've created here is a form that's got an input type equals text and then an input type equals submit. So the, H, the XHTML for this, just to do a sanity check, is pretty simple. Here's the body, here's the form element, here's symbol followed by the input element, a couple of line breaks just to separate things visually, and then the input. But there's something interesting here. So I haven't bothered um, at least for validity's sake here, to include the action line, though I could actually do that. And if I, well, let's focus on what, what is here. I do have a, what, on submit, which is an example of what from last week? Java. Uh, definitely JavaScript. Yeah, it's one of these event handlers. On submission of this form, invoke the following JavaScript code. Well, what code should be invoked? Well, it looks like two statements. One, invocation of a quote function, which presumably is defined elsewhere in the page, and then return false. And let's do the easy one first. Why am I returning false no matter what happens here? So that the form doesn't actually get submitted. Right. Because the whole purpose here that motivates tonight is to do a more uh, dynamic interaction so that the whole page is not going to reload and show me new content. I want to abort this all together, but I still want to use a form elements, at least for this simple example, as my UI mechanism. So a familiar UI, but when I click that button, I want some data to be sent off, and then I want the response to somehow come back and be inserted into that page. Well, what am I doing then? Let's see. So if I scroll on up here, again, this is ajax1.html. The top of my page starts out pretty simple. I have the doc type for xhtml. I have the HTML elements, the head, and then I have some inline JavaScript. I could have factored this out to a file, but I just wanted to keep everything self-contained tonight so it could be clear. So let's see what's inside the script tag. So first, just as a refresher, the cdata section, what's the point of that? Why is that there? Yeah, so we don't want this content to actually be parsed here because we might have some uh, open brackets or some closed brackets for less than or equal signs, and so we don't want that to be confused for the start of markup. So I'm going to put the whole thing in a CData section, which prevents the XML parser from misinterpreting this stuff, but it doesn't prevent the browser from executing it. Now, the very first thing there seems to be declaring effectively a global variable called XHR, XML HTTP request. It's just the acronym there. And I'm initializing it to null, so some known state. And now I have this function called quote. So it's upon that page's submission that quote is invoked. So what am I doing here? Well, I'm going to try, so to speak, to do the following. And for those unfamiliar with try catch, it's a typical approach in a language that supports exceptions, but just to treat it literally. Try to do the following. The first thing I'm going to try to do, as I alluded to earlier, is this line, which is trying to do what? <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. It's trying to instantiate an instance of the XML HTTP request object, which we looked at briefly a moment ago. But if that fails, it's going to do something else instead. So it's possible that if that, fun if that object doesn't exist in this particular browser's implementation of a JavaScript, the expected behavior is that an exception of some sort is going to get thrown. And a catch block, as most of you probably know, means catch that exception and do the following instead. And this isn't really the right way to use exceptions, but it's sort of the way you do it in JavaScript in this multi-browser world. If something goes wrong, what am I trying to instantiate instead, apparently? Microsoft. All right, thank you. It's the, the Microsoft specific approach to the same problem. So this is simply ensuring now that if I'm using a browser like Safari or Firefox or I think Opera, the first line of code, the new XML HTTP request line, should work and return the equivalent of a reference to that object and store it in my global variable. But if that fails for some reason, I'm supposing that's because the user is using a different browser. So I'm going to try next as plan B to instantiate the Microsoft version of that same notion, which is called something different here, but behaviorally exposes those same methods that I pr uh, promised a moment ago. Frankly, if that doesn't work, this whole example falls apart because I don't have yet another try catch block in there. So in fact, I cut some corners here just to focus on the guts here. And in fact, you'll see or I'll try to make mention of later tonight, the really right way to do this is to have a series of, I think, four try catch blocks nested so that you can try to instantiate one of the four different known types for this object, um, many of them having to do with different versions of Internet Explorer. I chose one of the most common ones there, just we'll focus on the two. Um, <laughs> And I remind me, maybe Cato can remind me if I forget to uh, point out one of the bugs I made, because I made the mistake of testing my code only on IE on Windows, Safari on Windows, Firefox on Windows, but I didn't test Firefox on Mac OS or Vista, both of which broke my code. So <laughs> I'll try to convey some of the lessons I learned last night and Cato taught me while debugging all of this. So. What am I going to do here? I'm going to try to handle old browser. So if at this point in the story that thing is still null, something went wrong, maybe the user has JavaScript turned off, maybe they have some really new version of some browser or some really old version of some browser, forget it. I'm just going to bail out here, alert the user, and return immediately. But if that doesn't happen, if I'm using most any modern browser, first I'm going to construct the following. I'm going to construct a URL, just a string, to a file called quote1.php, which is another quick and dirty script I wrote, which we'll look at in a second, passing in just one HTTP parameter, it seems. I'm passing in the value of whatever is in the document's element whose ID is symbol. So this is some JavaScript uh, trickery that we looked at last week. If I scroll down, where is this field coming from? Well, I took care when defining this input field for the symbol, which is just a text field, of giving it a unique ID. And I called it, just for convenience, symbol. So when I call, recall, uh, remember from last week, get element by ID, what I'm getting is effectively a reference to that particular element in the document. And then I'm diving in deeper and getting its value property so that I'm actually getting the string value that's there and not a reference to the object itself, the node in the tree, so to speak. All right, so at this point in the story, I just have one long string that's like quote one dot PHP question mark symbol equals um, a G O O G if the user typed in Goog for Google. Well, what am I going to do? Well, all it takes to do the simplest of Ajax interactions is these three lines. One, I'm going to say that on ready state change, invoke the following function. So we'll see in just a second, and you can kind of already see, handler is a function that I defined later on. And what I'm doing here is telling this object when, you're, when you receive the ready state change event, invoke this function so that I can handle that change in your state. So this object, this XHR object, can enter different states, like the state of being about to send information, the state of having sent information, the state of having gotten a response back from the web server, and so forth. So anytime it changes internal states, this event handler, whatever function I give it, will get invoked so that I can do something. And I care about that because when this thing enters the I've gotten some information back from you state, I want to get at that information and insert it into the page or display it to the user. Well, what am I doing next? Well, I've registered that event handler. I'm going to open a connection 
to the URL I constructed, which is a relative URL in the same directory. I'm going to use the get method because it's nice, quick, and simple. And I'm going to space true meant what? Be asynchronous. Like let the user go back to his business within this website. Granted, there's really not all that much he can do in this website, but maybe if it were fancier, there's some other UI things he could be doing. But in the meantime, go ahead and send this request. And here's one of the first bugs I tripped over even last night. What was getting Firefox on Vista and Mac OS to complain was failure to pass in null explicitly, whereas in every other browser it worked just fine. So my own little gripe there. All right, I'm sure you will find your own in the weeks to come. So what happens now when that request to quote1.php with a symbol passed in comes back? Well, what is going to get passed back? Well, you can, might probably guess where this is going based on what the example looks like. Quote1.php is sort of a quick and dirty implementation of what m some of you have already implemented for project two. They have a feature whereby a user can get a quote. All I'm doing here with this quote1.php file is I'm calling fopen of that URL that we gave you in project two to Yahoo's CSV file generator. I'm passing in s equals whatever the get string symbol parameter was. And then I'm just using the field. So ampersand f equals e1, which if you remember from that gummy web website, just means the error flag. So I can check, does this, this, does this work or not? And then l1, which represents a little homework trivia, last trade. the last trade price. So the last price, so the current price effectively. So go ahead and open a connection. Then go ahead and call f get csv, which is the function most of you have been using to actually get that data back. At this point, I'm hopefully have gotten an array of size two, the first cell of which is an error flag, the e1 flag. And so this is sort of a hint for those of you wondering or haven't been reading the discussion board about how you can detect errors. This is one of the ways. Um, in the zeroth element should be that flag, so I check it here. And in, in cell one, should be the price of whatever stock I passed to this URL. So I've pretty much adopted from project two the very simple principle you all have been using to get stock prices and the big board has been using to get stock prices. But the only thing I'm going to do in response is just print it out. No XML, no HTML, no JSON. I'm just going to print out the price in a very simple web page. So in fact, we can see this. If I go back to my directory here and click on quote1.php, well, nothing seems to be going on there. But if I is a form submit saying manually symbol equals say G O O G enter, I should get back the last trade price for Google, and only that. If I want to try Yahoo, I can type its symbol, and I'm getting back just that content. So I've got a very simple dynamic um, data generator here. The goal now is to not have a user visit this thing, obviously, but for a user who's using this page to let the magic of Ajax go get that same response, but then I, via JavaScript, am going to integrate that value into my own web page as opposed to creating a whole new web page with the result. All right, so how do I do this? Well, as soon as the uh, Ajax request has gone out to quote1.php and that response has come back, that response isn't being displayed visually to the user in the browser, but it is tucked away somewhere in RAM. How do you get at that response? Well, you get back at that response via the event handler. Because at this point in the story, that object, the XML HTTP request, has changed state, presumably, from the I sent data to the I received data state. So at this point, I can sort of look inside that object and get out the data that I want. So the way you typically do this is as follows. First, I have this function handler, which takes zero parameters. But because this thing is global, I still have access to that same object. So if the xhr.readyState equals equals 4. So this is just a little cheat sheet that now is useful. That ready state property can be of any, uh, any of these five values, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. 4 is the only one I care about for this example's sake. I only care about when the data has come back i.e. the response has been loaded, so to speak. So I'm just saying, is the state you're currently in the one in which the data has been loaded? I don't care about any of the other states. I only care about acting once you've gotten back this response. And if it is, is your HTTP response code that you received 
equal to 200. And this isn't a number you often see because it's actually a good error code, so to speak. You've all probably seen 404, page not found, 500, even worse, internal server error, usually your fault. 200 is the one you never see because that means everything was OK. And that's what we do care about. If quote1.php actually returned a successful response, a very simple page with just a price, then I care about inserting that answer into my own page. And so what I'm doing, seems I'm cutting corners with my own first example, I'm just displaying in a JavaScript alert whatever is inside the property called response text. Well, what is response text? Response text is literally browser would have seen if a browser pulled up this page here. So response text, in other words, if I've just typed in G-O-O-G and therefore have effectively passed symbol of the same to this file, this is response text, what I've just highlighted. So I'm just displaying that. So the net effect, if I run this thing finally, if I type G-O-O-G and click this form, it's not going to truly get submitted, but that JavaScript function called quote is going to get invoked. It's going to send off an HTTP request via that XML HTTP object. I'm going to sit there waiting for a few milliseconds. Then finally, the response comes back, at which point the XML HTTP object event handler to say, hey, David, here's your response that you requested asyn um, asynchronously, then I can now display my alert with Google's price. Okay, Not quite what Ajax was meant for, right? We didn't really need all that just to create an ugly looking JavaScript alert. So let's take things to the next step with this second, though still simple, example. All right, so in the second example, the only thing that's changed, fortunately, is the UI. Now if I type in Goog and hit get quote, now I at least see it on the same page. If I type in MSFT, I at least see it on the same page. Still not beautiful, but let's see how we did this. All right, the XHTML is old school by now. I just added another uh, input element. Now granted, normally these things are meant to take user input, not display output, but I'm using it because it's easy and I can get the job done this way. So I have now a price field, type text, ID equals price. And it's that ID attribute that's going to allow me to uniquely find it in the DOM and plug in my value there. So what needs to change? Before I scroll up and before your eyes scroll down, what's the one line of code that needs to change in what was our first implementation here? Yeah, so ditch the alert and instead do an assignment of whatever was in response text and store it in that node's value. So really just one line of code changes down here in my handler function. The blinking line is all that needs to change. So call documents get element by ID function, which will become your friend evermore as you do start doing Ajax stuff. Get the ID, the node whose ID is price. And I, assuming you've created this page correctly, only one such thing should exist. Now at this point in the story, you have an object. You want to get at its value, that is whatever the string is in that field. And what do you want to put there? Well, whatever came back in that particular object which is namely the price, assuming all has gone well. And that's it. Now the catch is, of course, why is this not perhaps the best UI? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's certainly sloppy. Like, I can put anything here, and now granted, if I just re-get the quote, it should override that, but this probably is not an interface to be proud of. Right? It'd be much better if we could sort of integrate the data into the page, because that's really the end game here, is better UIs. All right, and maybe faster response time. So let's take a look now at ajax3.html. Notice now that I've tweaked the xhtml ever so slightly. There's no longer an input field there, but what is there instead? Yeah, so there's a span. Because now what I want to do is visually create a page that's still just as simple, it dare say ugly, but at least doesn't have the big text field, but at least has a placeholder where I want to insert the price, which is more consistent with expectations or given our goals here of Ajax. So if I now want to insert the price of Google into the page and achieve an effect like this, well, the idea is going to be the same, but now instead of inserting it into a text field, I'm sort of inserting it as a child of a, what kind of element? the span element. So I just arbitrarily decided that I'd at least like to give the user a bit of warning that, hey, there's going to be some content here, but I didn't need to do that. And the reason it works is because inside this span by default is a child that's a bold node. 
which itself has a child, using our DOM speak tonight, which is a text node containing quote unquote to be determined. So what's going on then with the JavaScript? Well, here too, we get the elements by ID, by way of its price ID, or its ID called price. And now there's this other property. So it turns out that most XHTML elements have this property because they're DOM nodes called inner HTML. And this is sort of this weird bridge between the DOM world and the XHTML world, whereby the quick and dirty way, so to speak, to insert content into a page is just take a blob of HTML that you whipped up or that a server returned and just insert it into the page and let the browser parse that, construct the little subtree, and then insert that subtree into the DOM. So you don't have to do all the work. Now granted, I'm not inserting any HTML, I'm just inserting a price, a number, the response text, but it suffices then to clobber whatever the innermost HTML is of that span element, whose ID again is price, and just put in there what the response text is. Yeah? So you're removing that bold element. Exactly. So what that do is doing is chopping off the bold child and inserting a new one, which is just a text node. Yes? Ah, good question. So can we put the bold tags around the response text? All right, so let's try that. This thing here is just a string. So what if I just do something like uh, bold, and then plus is the concatenation operator in JavaScript. Let me let this wrap a little more neatly onto the next line. And then let's concatenate close bold. OK, save that. This is ajax3.html. Let's refresh. Type in msft. So yeah, now it is bold. And in fact, just to make clear, let's change it to italics. It's not going to be totally clear since it's pretty small, but it's still bold by default. Uh, let's type in goog. Now it is, in fact, italics. Now, this is a little sloppy. Just someone give us a little sanity check here. What would probably have been the better approach? OK, so we could have had the server send that. In fact, let me roll back to that, because that's actually a perfect segue to where we're about to go. Let me go back to the original. You know what, if we already are statically generating the same content, there are many different ways we could approach this. But let's just go back to the source. If we go to um, quote1.php, rather than have it just print out the data, eh, if we know we want this to be outputted every time, let's just have PHP do it. And I'll fix that in just a moment. So now. Just to be clear, what's happening in the browser is when I click reload, notice it's bold. It's still small text. But if I view the source of this page, it's just that. So now that's what would get inserted into this page if I type in MSFT, enter, MSFT. Uh, wait. Let's roll this back. Uh, Ajax 3, quote 1. Ta -ta. Let's type in on that BBY. What's going on? XHR. I got to stop doing demos on the fly, huh? OK. OK, your simplest of JavaScript debugging techniques tonight will be this, though we'll show you something better. OK, Goog. OK, it is coming back. Oh, <laughs> let me chalk that up to a Microsoft caching quirk or something weird like that, because I do think it was correct. OK, so we can do it in that way. <laughs> um, let's posit at least one other approach, right? So the, the goal now is to retain the bold facing without clobbering it. Another way? So we could just apply some CSS to the span element, either in line with the style tag. We could use a class. We could use some style sheet externally. Another way? Yeah, so we'll actually see a couple of functions that will facilitate this, this approach. But if really we have by default this bold element that's a child of the span whose ID is price, we do have some functions we'll see that will allow me to get the element called uh, the, ele the span element whose ID is price. And then I could execute a function that gives me his children. And I could dive into the first and only of his children and then uh, tack on the returned HTML as the inner HTML of that child.
Or I could just move the ID attribute from the span to the bolt element. That would be another way. So there are many different ways. Um, I took one, and it's part of the whole design process to figure out or to decide which is best. And there's um, typically no one right answer. Okay. But probably, frankly, regenerating the bowl tag each time, I think that's arguably not a good approach. Since what's the point? Okay, questions? Yes? Um, did you need to create that separate uh, PHP page to handle to that actually? That, actually that, that separate PHP actually does the work and returns the response to this page. Did, Correct. Is it, is it possible to do that all in one page? Or do you have to Ooh, uh, so good question. So we currently have this disconnect between what I've called Ajax 3.html and quote 1.php. So the client side code and the server side code. In theory, you could merge these two files, but I would argue in this case that would be a very weird thing to do because they have very different roles in this case. And this isn't really the case of a form being submitted um, back to the same page because typically when we've done that with PHP, you're changing the whole page. Now, if you did that in this case, you'd have to special case it, whereby if you just pull up the page by default, you get all the JavaScript and then all the XHTML content. But on the AJAX request, you want to have that same file only generate just the price, which is a very different type of output. So I would argue that keeping them separate actually makes a bit more sense. It's a little cleaner. But instead of doing that, couldn't you, where you're, you're doing the uh, open to your quote1.php mm -hmm. URL, couldn't you make that as an open to uh, download.yahoo and then in your handler pull apart that? Oh, absolutely. So we wanted to get fancy, and we, I mean, yes, if we wanted to do this all ourselves. To, to URL request. Uh, right, so in theory, in theory, we could make that, re we could make the Ajax request. Um, Right, so there's some annoying cross-site um, cross security restrictions that you might run into, and I actually think that violates it. If you try to pull in data on one site, but is that true? Let me do a sanity check. So there might be security implications, which I'll figure out on the side. Even so, I would argue that it'd be much bigger pain to do that, frankly, in JavaScript than to just whip up a two-line PHP file, thanks to fgetcsv and fopen. But yes, absolutely, we have a programming language here, JavaScript, but we would have to parse the CSV file itself and just move a lot more code into here, which we could do. But um, frankly, I found this approach much simpler. Yeah? Asynchronous also means that responses might arrive back in an order other than they were sent. Yes. Is each process to completion or the JavaScript process one response completely before? No, it's a good question. So this example, fortunately, I've kept simple enough that you don't really see this problem arise because I'm using this global variable here. But yes, if you're making asynchronous function calls, you, I, if the user could click on the button multiple times and multiple responses should come back in order. The problem then with what I've done here, actually, there's no problem in this example because you would just keep clobbering the value that's in that field. But if I, as you'll see in future examples, am trying to remember what the symbol was that was passed in and therefore need to remember which response goes with which request, then you have to be more careful about what you're doing. But yes, asynchronicity allows you to invoke send uh, multiple times and get back multiple responses and it's left to the programmer to actually keep track of those or to use some framework that makes that easier. Okay. Other questions? Yeah? Say, uh, going back to our, our first person, the next one. Okay. Where we're doing this with an alert. Okay. And suppose that whatever's happening in our, our URL, mm -hmm. takes a significant amount of time, mm -hmm. like several seconds, during which the user closes that window but leaves their browser open. Does the response just fall into a big bucket? Oh, good question. So if the if the browser session is closed, the, well, we've the browser session open. Oh, but the user does what then? The user has closed that window or that tab. Oh, it would be presumably browser dependent as to whether or not it kills that connection right away, or if it does return, but there's no longer an event handler registered, so the browser just deals with it. It's probably it's not defined by any spec I know, so I would say it's implementation dependent. Other questions? All right, so let's just. 
take a look at this now, this slight variant. So if I scroll down now to the bottom of Ajax 4, notice that just frankly for some internal debug, quick and dirty debugging here, just to introduce a couple of techniques, notice that I've included now um, the symbol field still, so the user has some place to type, but now I'm using a text area because I decided with this example that I want to up the stakes a bit and not query quote one dot PHP, but quote two dot PHP. The reason being I spent a little more time on quote two dot PHP so that I could retrieve not only the latest price, but also the high and the low. So we're sort of taking things up a notch in the sense that now I'm having multiple pieces of data coming back and so we're going to see in just a moment motivation for now semantically tagging this data like with XML for instance so that I know what represents what if I just have a sequence of numbers coming back. Now I'm taking the quick and dirty approach of with this example I still just use Yahoo and I grab via the S equals the symbol and then I change the field somewhat. Now I have E1 L1 HG, which is error, price, high, and low. And then I'm just having this page print not just the price, but now the price, colon, and then the value of the current price, then a new line, then high the same, low the same. So effectively now, this quote 2.php file is not terribly interesting by itself because what I get back is data like this. But now the goal is to integrate more pieces of data into my website. I'm going to do this the simplest way possible at first with ajax4.html. Notice that I'm taking this really hackish approach of searching, say, for Google, get quote. And the easiest way I know how to insert multiple lines of text into a page is just to use a text area, which understands those new lines. So that's one step up. And I actually offer that, and we'll use it again in a future example using text areas while developing just to dump the contents of something you're inserting into a web page is actually really nice because you can actually see the raw HTML or the XML content. So think of this as sort of a, one of those printf uh, spirited types of debugging techniques. But now let's return our attention to what the example is, which is Ajax 4. Almost all of the code is the same, except I am, of course, querying quote 2. PHP. I'm getting the quote with the exact same lines of code as before, but now my handler is getting the element by ID called result, which is just the ID I gave to that text area, grabbing its value. So getting the value of a text area is little different from getting the value of an input field and plugging in the response text there. So that's all, but what is not so good about this approach? Right, if the goal is to integrate multiple pieces of data in this sense. All right, so it's all one chunk of code, new lines separated. It's, it's not terribly interesting. And certainly displaying the results in a text area is not the best UI decision as well. Well, we, I've sort of forgotten the fact, or I haven't learned the lesson that came up a moment ago. I have access to a server-side language here that can generate anything I want. Now, presumably, if I want to integrate the price and the high and the low to my page, it's going to be formatted in some way. And if I know that a priori, I might as well just put that logic maybe in the PHP file and have it spit out not something as trivial as this, but maybe I could have my PHP file output an HTML table or maybe at least some bold tags to pretty this thing up and not just return raw text. So in this example here, in Ajax 5, which is another baby step along the way toward making this more interesting, Notice that I'm using quote 3 dot PHP. And if you suspend that thread for a moment and look at quote 3 dot PHP, <laughs> notice that again, it's just a baby step, but I'm getting rid of the new lines and actually outputting XHTML. So I'm separating each of these lines with a BR tag just to make clear the fact that now when this data comes back, and this is again quote 3 dot PHP, now I get back something that looks pretty much the same, but if I view the source, I've now done the XHTML generation on the server side, which is nice and quick and dirty and for something simple, really few downsides if you know how you want to structure the data. We're not really wasting that much bandwidth by sending a couple BR tags. So in Ajax4.html, my handler function now doesn't insert it into the value of some field, but now we're back to this other approach of inserting it into the web page itself by way of that inner HTML property. So what we're seeing then is that there are these different ways of inserting data in Ajax wise into a page. Either you can do this approach with XHTML generated on the server side 
And that page, the PHP files are returning, as you know, by default, the text HTML MIME type, which just says, here comes a web page. You don't have to output a whole web page with a doc type and an HTML element. You can just output fragments, certainly. And then we're just using that inner HTML property in the DOM to insert that content. But maybe there's a better way. Because argue if you think this through, what are some of the downsides of taking this approach, whereby I'm generating something that is preformed XHTML content, even though this is just a tiny example thereof. It's not really modular. You can't use it anywhere else. Yeah, it's not really modular. Like I couldn't integrate this data in multiple different places. I couldn't really perform any mathematics, for instance, on the client side because I'd have to parse that manually, which seems a bit silly. Other objections to this approach? So fragile in just that you're sort of making a decision in advance, pre-generating, and that's fine. But there's this, you're sort of blurring those lines between data and presentation yet again. And Ajax is really about fetching new data and displaying it to the user. And we've already seen, if briefly, that you have the ability with JavaScript to control aesthetics functionally with like the class property, the class name property, the style property. So you don't have to do any stylization server side. Imagine this were a bigger chunk of code, and I kind of hinted at this one objection. What's bad, arguably, about generating XHTML on the server side? Sorry? Yeah, so the time to bring it back. Now, that's not that many characters, but each of those BR tags is another, what, three, four, five, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six bytes that are just gratuitously being sent because I've done the survey. Um, the generation server side, when really all I need is the data. And then the client side, especially given how fast the user's computer probably is, I can generate things like BR tags pretty darn quickly, either in JavaScript or with some DOM functions, we'll see. So in short, there are motivations for other techniques. And herein lies sort of the way um, to do AJAX, or the way that um, the capital AJAX acronym sort of suggested. AJAX stands for, or stood for, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. That's clearly not necessary since we were just generating, yes, some XHTML, but I could have generated HTML. I also generated just ASCII text. But XML is just one way in which you can return the data. So these days, kind of a silly semantic thing. What was once uh, AJAX has now become AJAX. So no longer is it fundamentally tied to XML. In fact, increasingly popular is this other approach called JSON. So let's see just one of these approaches in contrast with the HTML approach. So if we go to uh, ajax5.html, what we have here is an example that is calling on quote3.php, which again generates this XHTML. Oh, you know what? I got I flipped these around. What are we in? Quote. Yes. So in Ajax 6, I wanted to leave you with a visual here. So we're not going to do it the fancier way yet, but we are going to improve the aesthetics here slightly. So how can we go about being a little more intelligent about providing the user with some feedback? There are certainly some sites out there that are not necessarily the fastest response times and pretty common on like uh, uh, even Google Maps and Kayak, you get some kind of progress bar, right? Some kind of activity indicator saying something's happening even though the page hasn't changed just yet. A very humble goal. Well, what if I want to type in something like Google and it's going to take a while to come back? You know, sort of the poor man's approach here is just tell the user with text. All right, and now it came back. So that was really slow. So apparently I really messed up quote3.php because the response is coming back pretty slow. But let's take things up a notch. Rather than just have this text, What's more common, certainly, is something like this, MSFT. Wow, now that's dynamic website design. And now the response comes back. Now just take a guess. What was that you just saw? All right, so it's just an animated GIF that David found by Googling animated GIF. All right, you can plug anything in there, but there's some neat trickery clearly going on that's hiding that GIF, a GIF when it's not necessary to be displayed. And then it's um, displaying it when the uh, asynchronous call is actually in progress. But these calls still seem to be pretty slow. If we look up Best Buy, again, now it's going to come back. And now several seconds later. All right, well, how, what, where in lies this, this um, 
This latency, well, some of you, if you've looked ahead to quote four, turns out that calling sleep on five seconds will slow down the execution of your code, but it does allow us to pretend that the server's slow, even while we're generating the same output. So that's one way I was able to mimic this. But how were we doing this? Well, Ajax 6, recall, was simple. So it just displays, and IE is again caching on us. Uh, let's do uh, APPL, or is it AAPL? AAPL? Should have used fewer than five seconds. There we go. All right, so there we get back another quote. So five second delay, but it just showed us some text with that first version of uh, this thing here. So how did we do this? Well, if we scroll down and look at, um, let's say, quotes. So down here, we have this placeholder. So again, have in this page just a default placeholder that says, quote will appear here. And that, recall, is what I changed to say, uh, please wait, or loading. What did I have it say? Looking up symbol, dot, dot, dot. So what we seem to be doing is not inserting that dynamic data there only, but I'm also inserting just some text to just hold the place of the data to come. So here is that div. I could have used a span or any number of different elements. I just chose a div for a little division of the page. I gave it an ID of quote because when the user clicks the button and that quote function gets invoked, notice that all this stuff is the same, which is why I've been ignoring it completely. It's the same as in previous examples. But now, as this comment suggests, inform the user what I'm doing. So in a hard-coded fashion, and there are different ways to do this, get the element by ID of quote grab its inner HTML property and clobber it with just this semi-useful message, dot, dot, dot. It's not animated, but at least we're informing the user of something. Then execute the asynchronous call as usual. And the one thing I now need to remember to do in my handler is what? Exactly. Replace that inner HTML again, this time with the actual response, which we've done in previous examples, thereby clobbering it again. So again, sort of a quick and dirty approach to providing some temporary feedback, which is useful for slow connections. It's a little neater when you want to do it with an animated GIF. And there are different ways of doing this, but frankly, one of the simplest ways is to find a freely distributed animated GIF that you like that indicates progress and do something like this. I'm going to scroll down to my XHTML. And now notice, a lot of line breaks just separate things in a quick and dirty way. So symbol is still there as before with the input type. Then below that is a division, a div element, ID of which is progress, the style of which is display colon none. So there's a couple of ways you can control visibility of an XHTML element. There's the display CSS property, which can be set to none, which means don't display it. Uh, block, which means show it as a block element or inline. Show it as an in ele inline element like a span would be. Um, by default, what I'm saying is don't. here's a div. Here's some content inside of it. Don't even bother displaying it. But presumably, it's still in the DOM. It's just been turned off visually. Inside of that is my image. That is pleasewait.gif, which is the image I downloaded. And I just have some line spacing there, and then I close the element. So it's there in the page. And in fact, if I ditch this CSS and reload ajax7.html, it is in fact there always. But now it's just on. So the goal of Ajax 7 now is to control really just the CSS properties. I don't need to bother inserting the new GIF and then removing the GIF, inserting it. Right? I don't have to keep changing the DOM when CSS provides exactly this kind of functionality, aesthetics. So what am I doing in the quote function? Well, the first thing the quote function now needs to do is show the user this progress. So I'm going to get the element known as progress by its ID and get its style property, which I promised last week exists, along with class name. I'm going to change the style properties display property to quote unquote block, which just means display it. How do you know that block is the opposite of none? Any CSS reference, frankly. So one is off, one is on. Now when the, quote, the call gets executed asynchronously, handler eventually comes back five seconds later, apparently, thanks to my sleeping. And now how do you hide the progress once the function handler is invoked? I'm going to get that same element again, going to get its style property, its display property, and change it back to quote, unquote, none. 
Now, I could have done this other ways, right? I could have changed the DOM. I could have changed the class. I had one class where display is block, another class where display is none. And I could have used not dot style, but dot class name, as we saw briefly last week. So many different ways. But the point is that I'm not changing the DOM this time. This is just an aesthetic trick. And because I'm using a block element and displaying it, that means that when I actually have this here and type in something like um, running out of new symbols, uh, symbol, please. IATC. IATC. So now five. I see five seconds of that, but then as soon as that element's hidden, I meant INTC. oh, INTC. Well, as soon as we get INTC's response back, the graphic goes away because notice the button is moving. So uh, the other alternative, FYI, and a lot to turn this into an HTML lesson, but the another alternative to the display property of CSS is the visibility property of CSS, which allows you to turn the visibility of an element on or off, but it doesn't, it leaves room in the page for that element. So whereas in this one, I wanted the page to sort of dynamically resize itself. If you use visibility, it just doesn't show or it shows. Doesn't, does show. Okay, let's take a five minute break. All right, so we are back. We've been using some of these things, but now let's just see what is available to you because some others are useful as well. So an object in JavaScript is just a collection of name value pairs. So what are the names or properties associated with the XML HTTP request object? Well, there's one property called onReadyStateChange, which is just a property that if you set it equal to a function, that function will get executed anytime the object changes state which we've seen is what makes all of this possible. There's the ready state property, which is just an int that tells you what state it's in, a la finite state automaton. Uh, zero is when you first create it, and four is when your request has already come back and been served. Then there's three ways of getting at the response from the web page that is fetched effectively by your Ajax call. There's response text, which we've seen, which is just the string that's returned, which is usually pretty useful. Then there's response XML, which will become useful in a moment. If you know in advance that what's coming back is actually XML, and therefore you don't want a string of XML, but you want an actual tree. You want a DOM to be returned to you so that you can navigate the tree itself. Then you can get at the response XML property, which is just a parsed version of the response text property. Then there's response body, which can be in binary format, which is useful if you're actually a la Google fetching binary data from a website and want to integrate that as well, which is not text or XML. Then there's the status code, which we've already seen. 200 is a good thing. Most any other is probably not such a good thing. And then there's status text, which is like the string version of the error code that might come back from the server. So that's just a sort of canonical reference for that. I noticed in Microsoft's documentation that IE8 will have a couple other non-standard ones added to the list, which should be nice. Uh, but let's come back to not our progress bar, but take things up a notch with the eighth version here. But before we do, any questions? Because we've thrown a lot of stuff out. Pretty rapid fire here, but sort of one step at a time. Any questions on progress bars, AJAX, this object? Anything at all? Yeah. The, um, you were using the uh, you were changing the, dis the, the display mm -hmm. um, style mm -hmm. from uh, what, none to none block to block and, and then back to none. Okay. Um, what if that um, what if that element was actually getting its display property from a a class in a CSS file? Mm -hmm. Can you use style that display here? Would it not work? Or would oh. it still work even though it's getting its property from it. It's a good question. So if you're saying if that element were already stylized with a class that was affecting its display property. Yeah, so the explicit attribute was not style. Right, but there was a class there. So I think, as per the notion of CSS being cascading, I think the most recently added style should um, override the previous settings. Um, I think in spirit that should happen, but I'd actually be a little nervous with cross-browser issues, and I might take a safer approach, but in theory, I think that should work. It should just override the parent, um, the original uh, stylization, but a good question. All right, anything else on one through seven? Yeah. Oh. 
You know, it's a good question. I, I don't know as much of the history other than it originating in some of the earlier Microsoft interactions. And I think early on it was more about just fetching additional data dynamically. And it was really, I mean, frankly, Google was one among the first to, in a very public way, popularize its use for Ajax, uh, for uh, UIs, as opposed to, say, Flash, which was commonly used. Um, but I would defer to some online reference for more of a history. Oh, interesting. Okay. So the history for the camera might uh, derive from uh, wanting to make a more interesting uh, email-based interface online. Uh, frankly, someone's probably taken the time on Wikipedia to write it up. So. In Ajax 8, we're using yet another version of quotes, all of which are slight variants of each other, but the goal now is to actually achieve this effect. So in Ajax 8, we again have a very simple goal, but now I have some placeholders in advance, and it looks like I'm probably using div or span elements there, whose values I'm going to somehow affect. If I do a search for Goog, it looks like it is inserting those three fields. So how is the data coming back? Well, I said that this is using uh, quote 5.php. So let's see what the raw response is, because it's just a uh, PHP file. And so now I'm using capital Ajax, it seems. And I'm actually getting back XML data. The upside of which is that now my data is semantically tagged in such a way that because I also have access to an XML parser, what I'm really going to get back in memory is like a tree version of this structure. And if you think back to our use of XML in project uh, one and your use of like XPath and those kinds of uh, that way of thinking about your data, I now have back an object of some sort via the response XML property that I can navigate and just pluck out the data that I might want. Now it's a bit more work client side in the JavaScript code, but for very dynamic, if not heavy, heavily data laden websites like an email client, like Google Maps, maybe this is in fact preferable because the client is much faster given that you have access to a whole gigahertz of CPU cycles as opposed to a server, which is more of a shared resource. Why bother doing uh, server-side processing, perhaps if you can avoid it. So what am I doing when I get this data? Well, in Ajax8.html, again, almost everything is the same, but the changes begin with this line. I'm changing it to use quote 5.php. And notice I've kept all these examples simple. In every case, I've been using the get method thus far, because I'm using a very small, finite amount of user input, just the string. So I'm not even bothering with post, but I could if a la Flickr and sites like that, I wanted to upload, for instance, photographs in the background. Well, I could use post and actually upload, in theory, an unlimited amount of data that way, but I've kept it simple with get. So now the magic must be happening in the handler function. Well, let's first see where the data is going to go. Here's the H, uh, XHTML. Looks like I just have some text placeholders and then a bunch of spans, each of which I've given some fairly intuitive IDs so that I know how to get at those elements. And now if I scroll up to my handler, it looks like, again, if this is a success, I'm first going to get define a variable called XML and uh, set it equal to response XML, just so I don't have to keep typing that thing again and again, just a shorter version of that. And remember that response XML, rather than give you a string of anything, gives you a parsed object, assuming that XML was in fact well-formed and thus parsable. So you have to trust yourself on the server side to be generating well-formed XML. Now what am I going to do? Well, what you can do now when you have access to a DOM effectively, even if it's not the DOM of the actual page, but like a mini DOM, a tree, parsed XML that's come back from another source, like quote 5.php, you can use DOM functions, which I promised exist a bit earlier. We've been using one like get element by ID a lot. That's one of them. There's also get elements by tag name. So in this example, remember I'm returning some semantically tagged data like this. So what I'd really like to get is all of the elements, that is one element called price, another one whose tag name is high, and another one whose tag name is low. I know in advance what these tag names are supposed to be because I define that file format, so to speak. So what this call here is it declares a JavaScript variable called prices. This function here, if you look at any of the three references I recommended earlier, is defined as returning an array of nodes from the DOM, each of whose name must be price. Now because I standardized quote 5.php, I can sort of make a leap of faith here and assume that what is true about this array, ideally, 
Ideally, there's just one element. And in fact, I'm going to do a little sanity check to make sure, lest maybe someone else was coding up the quote uh, PHP. And if it is, in fact, the case that there's just one price element anywhere in that document that was returned, I want to declare a variable called price. That is the very first price element in that array, an only element, presumably. I'm going to get at its first child property, and then at that um, child node value. So here, in, here comes again the whole notion of a DOM and the standardization of nodes. So every node in a DOM can be of a different type. We've seen element nodes, attribute nodes, what other types? text nodes, comment nodes I mentioned, and some other types of nodes. But each node has both a node name and a node value. So some nodes have, name, uh, uh, some nodes have names, some names, uh, nodes have values. For instance, a text node has a value, but no name. But a bold tag, for instance, has that, a bold tag that has nothing inside of it, open B, close B, has a name, B, but no value in that case. So that's the general spirit there. So what I really want to do now is grab the first child of the prices element. Well, what's the first child of the price element? Well, what type of node is that? It's a text node. Now, how do I get at the value of that text node? Well, node value is the property. And I know this by just having looked at one of the DOM references that we pointed you toward earlier. So I store that value in this variable called price. And then the second line, this is the easy stuff. This is, we've done for seven different examples. Get the element by ID called price in the local document in contrast to the XML fragment that came back. Update its inner HTML to just be that price. So and if I have controlled the whole, both sides of the story, the server side code and the client side code, it's probably pretty safe to assume that this is a safe call and I'm actually inserting a valid price and not messing up my whole HTML document. Okay? But you do have to be careful because if you're inserting HTML into your DOM, you want to be aware that you're actually inserting well-formed, for instance, XHTML or valid XHTML. And even then, as you'll realize as you bang your head against the wall for corner cases, my reading suggests that IE, for instance, doesn't play well if you try to insert XHTML or HTML that contains a form element. So dynamically inserting a form, supposedly, is yet one of the many cross-browser issues one might run into, which frankly just motivates all the more use of DOM functions, which is the direction we're going, where you dynamically create the content rather than have the server do all the work, and then you just kind of glom in the, the content that was generated server-side, which is quick and dirty and easy, but for large, complicated structures, probably not the way to go, as we'll see. These other things are identical. Update the low, update the high, a little down below here. Just grabs the different nodes by their IDs, inserts the data from the XML document, and done. So the net effect, just as a reminder, was that if we search for something like Yahoo, we get back all three pieces of data. But what's really coming back across the wire is this fragment and then being inserted into my web page. So let's see if we can't actually visualize this here. So let me go ahead and open Ajax 8. And I'll feel that in just one second. Let me go ahead and open up uh, Firebug, which is one of the debuggers we pointed you toward last week. I'm going to click the DOM node. And I'm going to pull up this URL, ajax8.html. And I've noticed this is sometimes a little buggy where it doesn't refresh. But notice that when I load this page by default, here's all of the properties associated with this document on the top level. So a lot of these things are aesthetics. And as you can see, all these mentions of height and width and offsets and scroll x and y, if you ever want to do something simple like find out the width of your browser window or the height thereof, welcome to the world of cross-platform issues where every browser sort of does it its own way. But we see at least Firefox's uh, view of the world with these properties. But the interesting stuff is here's a handler, which is a function we know. But remember that everything in JavaScript, functions and objects are all objects, which is why there's this little plus. I can expand and see what's inside that object, aka function. But for now, let's just look at XHR, which by default is that global variable initialized to null. So ideally, once I actually click get quote after providing a symbol, the order of operations was the quote function gets invoked, which then instantiates the XHR object, which then open, calls open and then send, 
and then returns immediately, and then eventually the handler gets invoked. So when I click that button, in other words, assuming Firebug uh, cooperates, this thing should no longer be null, but should actually be a chunk of memory in RAM that I want to be able to look at with this sort of simple debugger. So let's try this. And if all goes well, we'll do a bit of introspection here. So let's try Goog, get quote. OK, nothing changed down here, but I think if I click a few times and maybe close this whole thing all together, Let's try this again. Oh, OK, so apparently if you click on its name and then unclick, then it appears. Uh, let's, it's, a bra it's a debugger issue, not an AJAX issue. But now look at all this stuff that's inside of this XHR object. So notice that there, in fact, seem to be some things that feel a little browser specific, maybe. But there's some familiar stuff here on ready state change, ready state, response text, response XML. And now look over here, response text. There's the string that came back from quote5.php. It looks like response XML is a document. So when I say DOM, the, um, the class, so to speak, in JavaScript is called document. Lowercase document gives us access to the DOM for a web page. But if we dive in here, response XML, notice that now, and I'll make the debugger window a little bigger, notice that inside of response XML is a whole bunch of stuff like node name which doesn't really have a name, but by default it's given sharp document, which is sort of like the default name. But its value is kind of interesting, or rather, not its value, but its child. What was the first child of the XML fragment returned according to uh, update 5, dot p quote 5.php? Looks like a quote element. So let me click on first child, and it looks like it in fact is a quote element. Let's scroll back. Let me hide this. What's its last child? the last child of this little DOM that was returned. Yeah, it's sort of first and last, so hopefully there's some efficiency there. And they actually just refer to the same objects, but it in, in fact is still quote. But if I dive in deeper to first child, notice that it has a first child. What's the first child of quote? Yeah, there's kind of an answer right there in there too. So. Price, in fact, is consistent with this XML fragment. So I offer this up not so much because you need it for a fairly simple example like this, but there are ways to look inside of what's going on inside your browser's memory, at least for development purposes in Firefox, other than just using nasty text areas and lots of alerts like I initially was doing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The XML is the in-memory object representation of that string. OK, if I scroll up, the response text or response XML? Response text. OK. Same string. Not parsed. So that's literally what came back. If and only if it's actually XML, so will the browser tuck away in the response XML property the in-memory representation of that string, the result of having parsed it. Whenever you make a request, it, it, like, you parse it and put it into a DOM form? Yep, gives you both. Uh, another question. Yep. Uh, so in the, in, the, in the code, we're always referencing from the root. Mm -hmm. So does it support any kind of uh, dynamic traversing in terms of related to the escape where you are? Or related to the solution? Ah, uh, good question. So there's no built-in AJAX support for, um, sorry, there's no built-in XPath support, for instance. And so yes, everything is relative from the start of the DOM, which is the document node, or the document, yeah, the document object. So it's only the only way you could do it relatively if you use like the with keyword that we saw last week. But that's not quite what you mean. That just changes that just changes the scope, um, which is more of a JavaScript thing than a DOM thing. Oh, yes, so that's absolutely true. OK, so if that's what you mean, yes, you can. Oh, OK, OK. OK, good question. Yeah? Now, um, if what you're getting back from, from your server for mm -hmm. your HTTP request is not XML, but is text, mm -hmm. and, and you're not trying to insert some inner HTML, but trying to insert some text. Mm -hmm. into the, val the node value of say a text object. Mm -hmm. Do you need to do anything about encoding that text so that it doesn't turn into HTML? So it's a or does JavaScript do the HTML into the encoding? It's a good 
question. So in short, if you're getting back different types of data, to what extent, to summarize, can you trust that the browser will interpret XML as XML, text as text, and so forth? I suspect that there are browser-specific judgment calls if it's ambiguous. But one thing I didn't note explicitly is that in, for instance, quote5.php, which is my first version that outputs XML, I'm actually overriding PHP's default MIME type, which by default is text slash HTML. And what I'm actually sending is content type text XML, which is the queue, at least the primary queue to the browser. This is XML coming back, and therefore it should be parsed as, as much. I suspect if you send text slash HTML, it might still try to parse it, given that it could be XHTML. If it's text slash plain, probably not by default. And so response XML would be just null. But response text would have the response. But in, in your JavaScript mm -hmm. that's doing this Ajaxy stuff, mm -hmm. if you've got a string mm -hmm. just text that you really don't know what's the content of that text, mm -hmm. and you're trying to insert that text into your DOM. Mm -hmm. If that text happens to contain the string less than B O D Y greater than or something that looks okay. like an HTML tag. Oh, so I suspect there you'd really so, see uh, is there some do you need to encode that? With or the oh, I see. So if your if your font your uh, quote file, for instance, is returning less than signs, it should just insert that raw without escaping the data. I think, although that might be browser specific implementation. So some browsers might escape it for you, assuming that you're not trying to insert. Frankly, the right behavior of the browser is probably not to escape anything and just insert what you're telling it to insert. And the error, the onus is on you to make sure that that's not the case. So the question is, what happens if you try to insert non-well-formed content, like 2 is less than 3, which kind of sort of looks like HTML, but it's not. I suspect that most browsers would just insert it raw. And then, then the rendering engine would take over and either display it correctly or choke completely on that um, confusing content. Correct. Right. No, that's the thing. Well, it's standard in that it, it, the property exists, but it's the sort of quick and dirty approach. So you have to trust I'm yourself. I'm asking about if you're inserting it in as inner HTML. I'm asking if you're going down to where you've got something which you know is a text node, and you try to oh, insert interesting. It as a node value of that text node. Good question. I don't know offhand if you insert it as node value um, as opposed to using inner HTML. So let me check and I'll follow up. It's a good question. I suspect it's not escaped for you, but I'll check. I'll see if there's a definitive answer. Otherwise, it might just depend on browser. But good question. All right. Uh, so this was Ajax 8. So to summarize, we introduced some DOM functions and some DOM specific properties like first child, and you saw last child. And frankly, although one of those three references we recommended might be sort of the exhaustive tutorials as to what exists, frankly, using something like Firebug, a link to which is on the course's software page, is one of these useful tools that sort of teaches you just by throwing the information in front of you. And another tool that I would recommend, especially as we enter project three in a couple of weeks, is another tool linked on the course's software page called um, JavaScript Debugger, which is also for Firefox and gives you an environment like this, which is actually pretty straightforward. Um, when you pull up a page that has JavaScript in it, it'll show you on the top left all of the JavaScript related files that have been loaded into memory as a result of visiting the current page. You can expand those nodes up top there and actually traverse the JavaScript. You can right click and set breakpoints and then reload the page. It will pause execution at that point in the JavaScript. And then within these various windows, can you generally see what the local variable states are? You can actually look through the source code. And best yet, unlike IE's very unhelpful error messages with that little yellow icon, Firefox's debugger will actually tell you much more specifically what the error is. And it is a godsend when you're just trying to chase down even the simplest of bugs, because it gives you line numbers and more instructive uh, syntactical hints. So FYI for that as well. Wonderful for debugging, even if you don't normally use Firefox. All right, so where else can we take this? Well, in Ajax 9, let's actually see what's being done for us when we use these DOM functions. So in Ajax 9, I've made the following addition to my page. I now have this ugly but useful text area. 
because what I'd actually like to see is even though I'm going to be doing some DOM manipulation here, I just kind of like to see what's going on underneath the hood just so that I can sort of reassure myself that there is some bridging going on by the browser for me between inner HTML and actual DOM code and vice versa. So in this example, Ajax 9, I have this XHTML which creates that interface. Again, we have a text area here and the idea of which is code because I just want to do like a a little printf-like thing here for myself. And now what I want to do is the following. When a quote is, um, uh, let's show the functionality. So if I type in Goog here, I want to get quote and store the result using DOM functions. But now in my text area here, I'm seeing a little, oh, interesting, because we're returning the bold facing. It's interesting. Did I change this? This is using quote. Uh, Quote one.php, which did I change earlier? Interesting. Yet another browser issue. All right. We're going to bid farewell to IE for a while. There are actually, this, that's actually not bad motivation for our, the last of our examples, which will be when you should use an AJAX framework, which takes away a lot of these cross browser issues for you and deals with, frankly, like stupid caching issues like that. And you don't have to do all this try, catch, try, catch nonsense that I alluded to earlier. So in AJAX 9.html, let's get this quote. Now it gets inserted into the page there. It's ridiculous, the caching. MSFT. So this version is a little fancier in that now I appending to my DOM. I don't want to keep clobbering because now I want to maintain some kind of state here and this text area is really just meant to be my debugging window. So I'm using DOM functions to do the insertion but then I'm dumping inner HTML just to demonstrate that even as I insert stuff dynamically into my DOM that inner HTML property actually itself is changed for me by the browser, which is actually useful for also chasing down bugs if you're manipulating the DOM yourself and things are not rendering as you think they should be. You can dump the HTML that your browser thinks you've created so that you could frankly copy paste that into another file and then actually chase down say an HTML type bug. So in Ajax 9 what I'm doing is this. When my Here's my quote function. And I also introduced one other trick here, too. So recall that up until this point, I kept setting the on ready state change property to be the name of a function. Well, the only reason that function has existed in examples 1 through 8 is to get invoked as a result of a state change. So it doesn't really have to have a name. I just need that function to get invoked. And one of the tricks we saw last week is that you can have these lambda functions in JavaScript, nameless functions that can still take parameters and get executed, but you don't bother giving them a name. Because I myself never needed to call handler, open parenthesis, close parenthesis. So note that a very common coding practice in JavaScript, as you'll see in some of these frameworks, if you look at their source, is something like this. So rather than set xhr.onReadyStateChange to the name of a function that I define elsewhere, you can actually just define the function inline, so to speak, if you don't care about giving it a name. And so the trick I'm doing now is really just to get rid of the name of the function, but to set onReadyStateChange equal to the following chunk of code, thereby creating a nameless function that the browser remembers where it is in memory but doesn't need to call it by name. So the function is pretty much the same. Check ready state and check status. But now, and this is a more common Ajax practice perhaps, is to actually create nodes on the fly. Not just modify content that's there, but to create new content in the page. So I'm creating a variable called div, and then I'm calling the function, uh, the method called create element. What element do I want to create? A div. So what create element returns is effectively a reference to a new node in memory of whose tag name is div, and I'm tucking it away in that div variable. Now I'm creating another variable called text and assigning it the return value of create text node. Whereas the first method creates an element with a given name. This one obviously creates just a nameless text node. Because the goal here is going to be to create, for every time I get a quote, a new div, the child of which is symbol name colon price. The next div is going to have another symbol name colon price, just like the interface we saw a moment ago. So I have those two nodes now in memory. I've got a div and I've got a text node. What do I want to do conceptual in code now? And you can answer is kind of the next line, but. I'll, yeah, I want to put them together and hang this text node off of the div node. 
So it's not connected to the rest of the page yet. I'm sort of building a new branch that I'm going to insert into my tree, this time with code. So div.appendChild. So it turns out that any time you have an object that is a DOM node, especially an el that is an element node, you can call the method appendChild and pass to it any type of node, like a comment node, a text node, another element node, to create a hierarchy in the tree. So I'm appending that new text node to the div node, and then this last line of code in English is doing what? Exactly. I'm, R I'm appending to a node that already exists, namely the quotes node, which we'll look at real fast in a second, but I'm calling append child passing it this new node. So the only question at hand, perhaps, besides uh, what, is uh, what is this quotes node? Well, that's probably one of these ID things. So down here, I just have this placeholder when the page first gets loaded, a div that's empty but has an ID so that in memory it's just a leaf node, so to speak. And I just want to keep appending another div, another div, another div to it, each of which in turn has a text node so that the visual effect is something like this. And MSFT. So notice what's going on here. I'm just displaying the visual version of what I'm creating. And never mind Firefox's decision to show everything in capital letters. That's just what it's doing. You don't have to worry about it not being valid XHTML. But now we can see what's going on inside. And if I want to get really crazy here, what if I try on a whim this? I don't want to update. Uh, this code. So notice this line of code, we've seen something like this before. Get the code divs value and set it equal to, it wraps on two lines, the quotes nodes inner HTML. That's how I'm sort of dumping the resulting HTML. What if I want to do more than that and really do a big sanity check? Document.body.inner HTML. Assuming I've gotten my syntax right, what should I now see in this text area when I try this again? Yeah, so let's see if I got this right. So let's go back here, Ajax 9, uh, reload the whole page. Let's try it with Goog. Uh, oh yeah, no, that's okay. So not the whole page, just the body part of the page. So that's, that's consistent with what I typed. Uh, Yahoo, let's add that. Page is getting a little bigger, MSFT, getting a little bigger. If you haven't noticed, what's changing is more stuff's getting appended inside of this hierarchy here. Uh, AAP. It's not showing you the contents of the text area. Text area. Yes, it's not showing you the contents of the text area. Oh, so that's a nice, neat uh, solution to recursion. So, <laughs> but, and so forth. So the point here is just to help you visualize what's really just going on in this sort of abstract way of manipulating the DOM. So this is not useful beyond, I would say, uh, debugging or sanity checks. So any questions about these DOM-specific functions? Uh, yeah. You're, um, in each of these cases, you're sticking your new div element mm -hmm. as the new last child mm -hmm. of that quote element. Yes. Could you be putting it in as the first child or arbitrarily somewhere in the middle, say, if you wanted to be keeping an alphabetically sorted list? Yes, so off the top of my head, so to summarize, can you insert nodes in any place other than appending them to the end of the child list? Yes. If I recall correctly, one of the other functions, methods like append child is insert child, which I think starts at the beginning. Or what you could do is by way of that first child property, find the node that you want to put data to the right of, so to speak, or to the left of, and then you can append it or insert it to the left of it as a sibling would be, I think, another trick, but I'd have to, I'd have to check the online um, DOM functions to know if that's possible. So short answer, yes. Yeah? You could also read the value, oh. and then read the value that's there, and then um, append the existing value into the thing that you just retrieved, and then put that whole thing back in. Yes, yes, absolutely. So you could update the content. You just grab the node, make some changes inside of it, and you might not even have to add a new node if you're just um, modifying existing content. Yeah. So now we have a lambda function, mm -hmm. a name, and but previously and until then I wasn't really thinking about this, but um, this function doesn't have a return value. So how what actually gets assigned to XHR dot response XHR? 
Think of it like a function pointer. So when I set on ready state change equal to quote unquote to handler semicolon, think of handler as just being a function pointer. So it's the location in memory, uh, the location in the text segment of the program of the it's location of mem in memory of that function or reference to that function. So same deal here. When you have a so-called lambda function, you can think of this really, this line of code here. And it's sort of convenient that the function keyword looks like a function itself. The function function returns effectively the address of the lambda function that you're creating dynamically here. So what's being assigned to the property called on ready state change is, in short, a pointer to the function to be invoked. I'm still a little fuzzy, but that's okay. Okay, come on, come up after, if, and I can uh, speak. Uh, can try again. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Even if only part of the page is changing, if you had, if you could watch the browser and make it slow, is it still reloading the whole page? Is it? No. So in theory, the browser should be smart with its rendering engine as to which part of the page gets re-rendered. So no, it should not be redoing the whole page, because that would be rather contrary to the point. It should be able to re-render some subset of the page. And you can, sort of, you can sort of determine that empirically just by watching. If you insert artificial delays with JavaScript, you'll notice that the rest of the page will stay the same, and it just grows where new content is being added. OK, so in AJAX 10, what more can we possibly do to this thing? Well, it turns out that besides XHTML, which is sort of the quick and dirty way, and frankly, for small AJAX-like examples, like some of the ajax -y stuff we do on our website, I frankly take that approach, because it's very easy for me to write some PHP code that outputs the XHTML I know is going to get inserted to the page. We have a fairly lightweight website. It's not something a la Google that has a lot of complexity. So it's so much easier to just generate the XHTML insert it by inner HTML and be done, and not jump through these hoops of, frankly, the DOM API, which in JavaScript and in other languages is not a very friendly way of interfacing with DOM. And it's for that reason that you see things like XPath becoming more popular, because DOM traversal functions generally not so much fun, as you can sort of see how much more code it takes just to achieve the same goal. So it's a trade-off, but for sites that are getting much more data, it arguably does make more sense um, for performance reasons across the wire. You don't have to ship as much preformed data across the wire. Um, and also, you can navigate uh, the data, as, we, as someone noted earlier, in memory, as opposed to just getting one XHTML version that you're sort of stuck with. You mentioned XPath. We know about doing XPath on the server side with PHP. Are you implying that you can do XPath on the client side? Only with uh, third-party libraries right now. So you can integrate the equivalent of that, but it's not, you don't get it for free with major browsers. So in ajax10.html, there's only two more. I know this has been a lot of variants of this, this general idea. In ajax10, we're using now a different file called quote6.php, the spirit of which is the same, but the format of which is fairly different. In quote6, if I get a quote for Yahoo, what I actually get back it seems, is this. So it looks like an unknown file type has been returned. It turns out that the MIME type that came back is application slash JSON, J-S-O-N, which IE out of the box just doesn't understand. But if I go ahead and save this to my uh, desktop, it's called .php, even though it's not a PHP file right now. And let me go ahead and open this with my text editor, TextPad. What was just returned is this, which looks which looks like what? Don't say Jason. OK, so it looks like JavaScript, right? And this is, where, this is why we introduced what was otherwise somewhat cryptic syntax last week with all the curly braces and the uh, square brackets. Square brackets, recall, denoted arrays. Curly braces denoted objects. So what's actually been returned here effectively is the serialized version, the string version, of a JavaScript object, a nameless object that has three properties, one of which is called price, the other high, the other low. And each of those properties, as is the case with objects, has a value of 2585, 2664, and so forth. So I've gotten an object returned, but it's not really an object, it's a string. So now it'd be nice if I could let the browser transform this string, like it did the XML, into a nice little structure. Not an XML structure, because frankly, it's clearly not been that much fun navigating DOM structures. If this already looks like a JavaScript object, and the recipient in question here is what? 
JavaScript, it'd be really nice if I could just hand myself an object and dive right in and get the property called price and property called high rather than call get elements by tag name and jump through all those hoops, which just is not a lot more code. So one, it seems to be the case that we're saving on markup. There's no open brackets here. There's no tag names. This is just an object whose format I can infer if I generated this thing. And I should hopefully have more direct access to this thing. Well, let's take a look. In ajax10.html, the page looks almost the same. So the page looks like this. We'll use uh, Firefox. Goog, get quote. So now I'm just using my little text area just for some debugging so I can see what came back. I output the price via the DOM, but let's see how I'm outputting the price now to the DOM. So in Ajax 10, I'm going to go back to my handler function, which is still nameless. I instead went this time with just uh, now Vim syntax highlightings off. And now I have this function. So down here, this is the magic of JSON. So previously, via response XML, we had sort of easy access to an XML object, a DOM in memory. Not quite as easy as that with JSON, because there's no um, response JSON property, for instance, but we can create that pretty easily. Thanks to JavaScript's eval function, which in many languages is not considered a very good or safe thing, it's actually very useful in this context, because in response text, I know in advance that I, because I generated it, there's something that looks like a JavaScript object. The, all that remains is for me to tell JavaScript to treat it as an object and sort of load it into memory as such. And the function via which you can convert a string representation of an object into an object is by way of the eval function. And just flank it with a couple parentheses here. So what's now stored in the variable called quote is an object just a nameless object in memory that has three properties, namely, quick sanity check, price high and low. How do you get at the properties of a JavaScript object? It's so easy now. Now I can do this. I can still do my DOM creation functions because I'm just kind of, uh, this is a marginal change on the previous example. So I'm still going to create a div. I'm still going to create a text node. But now to get the value of the price, I can now just do quote.price. Because quote at this point in the story is a JavaScript object. So no longer do I have to do the get elements by tag names and get back an array, then get the zeroth element, then dive in and get the first child, and then the node value, all of which was just kind of unnecessary complexity for a very simple goal, which is I just care about a price property of the quote that I got back. And so in this way is JSON increasingly compelling because you don't have the overhead of all the markup that's inherent in XML. It's much more efficient. And so long as it's relatively easy to generate this stuff on the server side, there's no reason that you might, that, there's no reason not to let the server just output a more efficient, not only transfer mechanism, but also mem in memory representation, given that you know that the destination for this data is JavaScript. So how could I generate this? Well, this is using quote 6.php which looks like this. Well, how do you output, how do you generate JSON? Well, I use the print function and I printed a curly brace followed by price and then the price that I'd gotten back from Yahoo CSV, then the high, then the low, curly brace. Now, I did have to be careful. Like, you can't have an errant comma, you can't have an errant parenthesis or curly brace. It has to be well-formed JavaScript uh, object notation, which is what JSON stands for. So you do have to be careful with that. And in fact, using a val on a string that you just got back off the internet, generally not such a good thing. So there actually are libraries, that, and this may be standardized soon, that parses it more carefully and will not, for instance, uh, execute potentially dangerous JavaScript code, but for now we're keeping it simple. But all it takes is printing out the JSON and changing typically the MIME type at the top of the page. But I can do one step better. In fact, check this out. So a PHP, as you've perhaps come to realize, has the proverbial kitchen sink in it. So in, P in quote 7.php, I decided just for argument's sake, I'm going to have a class called stock because it'd be kind of nice, I've decided in PHP, to sort of represent a stock as an entity, like a structure. So I just defined a quick and dirty stock, all of whose fields are public for now. But now what I'm doing is I'm still outputting this application JSON type. But now what I'm doing in my PHP code, when I get back the CSV file, I'm tucking into a new stock object. These three fields, stocks price gets the first field, uh, stock high gets the second, 
and stock low gets the third. So now I have in PHP, in the server's memory, an object of type stock that is now storing all the appropriate fields. So guess what's going to be below the blinking line? It's the kitchen sink. So you can take an arbitrary PHP object, and assuming no issues with circularity and self-referencing, this will generate this call, which comes with PHP 5.2 and up, will create the JSON object for you, which is a really nice bridge to your sort of server side in memory representation and your client side in memory representation. Uh, question is over here, or yeah, yeah, Curtis. Um, yeah. Uh, so the, for the JSON encode function, uh, the this, this stock variable there has to be a what? It has to be. It will serialize that object in JSON format. So inside of your class can be some public fields that will get serialized like this. You can have an array in there. So if I actually stored that, this is where it gets really powerful. And I've kept the example simple. But if, for instance, we said that the stock actually had, you know, just to be uh, simple here, we could say stock uh, fields gets data. So I'm storing the data array, which f get CSV gave me, inside of a public field called fields in the stock. What would actually get serialized down here is not something quite as simple as this, but what you would instead get, because I don't have these names, is you'd have fields, colon, what's the marker for uh, an array? So you get square brackets, so that what you'd actually get back is something that looks like this. I'm throwing away some metadata here, like the property names, but this is where the in JSON encode function is a beautiful thing, because it's sort of recursively similar in spirit to print R will sort of make it not look like printr's output, but like JSON's output, assuming you don't have weird relationships among your objects. So if it can be serialized in JSON format, it will do so. Does it ignore methods? It will ignore methods, yeah. Just do the, the, the data members. Do they have to be public? I believe they have to be public, yes. If they're private, I don't think that will work. But I've not tried it. Uh, it's very similar to Java to string. I mean, PHP has its own built-in serialized method. So if you've ever looked closely at what a session file is, so a quick aside here, sessions, recall, are just stored on the local file system, usually in slash temp as a file. How do you store an arbitrary object on a file system? Well, you serialize it. You don't use JSON, though, typically. PHP will call it serialized function, which creates a similar spirit syntax, but it's more complicated that retains the data types inside the object. JSON throws away data types. OK, so we're not quite at our utopia yet here, because I've sort of, and even I tripped over some of these myself last night, I've tried to be as careful as possible to avoid any cross-browser issues. But it turns out that you will invariably, especially when you do more interesting things, start to stumble across, frankly, what are typically stupid things. Like, for instance, the send function working in almost every browser, except a couple, one of which is the same browser on just a different operating system. So it's these kinds of things that unfortunately suggest we're still in a bit of a sorry state when it comes to cross-platform development here. So fortunately, some very smart folks with lots of free time have tried to help solve this problem by providing the world with various um, frameworks. And some of the most popular ones, I would say, that are AJAX related would be these. I personally tend to be a fan of um, YUI. I previously called this UE, but apparently there's a video on Yahoo's website where one of the developers pronounces it YUI, so I have to retrain myself. Uh, so YUI I tend to use just because I've, they have so much other stuff too, and I just kind of like using their one foundation. But very popular is prototype. Um, um, uh, jQuery, I mean, all of these that we've put up here are sort of some of the most well-knowns. And there are dozens of others out there as well. I'll demonstrate one of these here, because the course itself doesn't have a particular bias. The YUI stuff is just my own. But let me scroll back for just a moment to make clear what I put on here for a reason. So this here is a little screenshot of JSON.org, which should, uh, gives links to some of the more popular JSON libraries for a whole bunch of languages. So what's increasingly compelling about JSON 
is that there's a lot of support for it. PHP has built-in support. So under uh, PHP, notice you can see in red the ones I clinked, clicked myself, PHP 5.2 just has native support. What's that native support? Well, I used one of the functions. There's another that goes in the other direction if you actually need it. But JSON and code, passing it a value, will serialize it as JSON. On the other end, you need to call eval of that same string. And I would point you toward, for instance, this last URL for more examples of that, but we've pretty much conveyed the essence of it. Um, for those of you who would like to have for your project three some nice progress bars, there's some nice uh, public domain stuff available there. But as for frameworks, one of the um, simplest to use, frankly, is YUI, because it standardizes across multiple browsers, across multiple operating systems, just the basic ideas that we've been looking at tonight. So in our final example, Ajax 12, notice that I begin my page this time by including the Yahoo API stuff. So I know just by reading the uh, URL that we just flashed on the screen that I need this library, this one, and this one. So it's a little heavy. Um, there are minimized versions of each of these because Yahoo uses a compressor on its code, but I left the, these in there just so you can see what the source code looks like. Um, scrolling down to my own C data section, and of course, I could have put this in my own JS file, but I wanted to keep, give us as few files as possible tonight. Um, notice that my quote function boils down to just this. I first wanted to just retain the symbol, which is just an aesthetic thing for this example. I generate the URL exactly as before, and the, all it takes for me to generate an asynchronous Ajax call using Yahoo's library is to call this fairly long named method, get method, the URL, and then now notice this. What is this somewhat cryptic syntax an instance of? It's sort of like an inline nameless object because, again, an object in JavaScript is just a bunch of name value pairs. Well, the way that Yahoo's library tends to work is that you can pass in multiple arguments by way of an object, like a hash. Uh, map effectively. And I just chose to do just one, the most important. One of the properties you can pass as this third argument here inside this object is a success handler. So what I'm saying with this code is if Yahoo experiences a success with this Ajax call, invoke this function. There's also another property. I could have put comma failure colon function name, but I don't even bother handling failures for this case. I just wanted to care about successes. So here's my handler function. And now notice, because I'm using some JSON, it is pretty darn simple. So all this code we've sort of been trotting through tonight, doing things the old-fashioned way, and not even the most robust way, really gets simplified when you start using one of these frameworks. And you'll see from Yahoo's own documentation, there are many uh, additional features that come with the Yahoo library that generally make your life a lot easier. And just to give you a sense of this, let me go real quick and open up our own copy of Yahoo's library, which is in lib, yui, build, connection, connection.js. So recall we saw this thing earlier, microsoft.xml.http. So the other two strings that are sometimes supported, depending on the browser and OS, are those things there. So let me actually search for this string, uh, which is down here. So when I said that there's a lot of trying and catching and trying and catching, well, here's your loop that's doing a lot of trying and catching, iterating over that array, just trying and trying and trying to instantiate an object that of ultimately the XML HTTP request type, and the, hopefully one of them will succeed. So just to make clear, this is the kind of stuff that Yahoo and Dojo and these other, well, not Dojo for Ajax, but that these other libraries will do for you. And the reason that we've tried to introduce last week in this some of this more cryptic syntax of like square brackets and uh, colons and curly braces is just because folks who like to write really fancy JavaScript tend to use this notation a lot. So it will hopefully help you read these libraries as well as you try to figure out what they can do for you. So that's a lot of Ajax. And you've seen Ajax from start to finish, granted in small context, but in project three we'll likely bite off more of it. So we'll see you in two weeks.